Let's take our Bible and turn to 2 Corinthians 11. That's our uh, launching pad. And then we're going to go all through the Bible. And uh, just see how God showed me something last night, just how relevant this Bible is. God's got all the bases covered. That's a baseball term. And it means that you've got somebody on every base defending all the bases make sure nobody gets a run but he's got all the bases covered god's figured everything out he sees everything before it happens god's knowledge of everything that's happen happening and will happen god knows it all um i've read s s some poor fools their commentaries of uh, one was Finnis Dake, and he said that God doesn't know everything that's going on. And so that's why he has to send out angels to go report back to him what's going on. And I'm going, that is, coming from Dake, that's not the stupidest thing he's ever said, but it's right, right up there. And uh, God knows everything. God's figured it out. And um, I was studying this last night. Uh, in relation to Genesis chapter 3 and what the serpent did there. And it just occurred to me, and I'll, I don't know if I'll get to it this morning. You might have to wait till next Sunday. So, Randy, if you want to hear this, show it next Sunday, all right? Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians 11, but I fear lest by any means, that's verse 3, as the serpent beguiled Eve, and the key word here is as, that's a very important word in the Bible because God shows you Things that are going to happen or he, or he relates doctrinal issues to events in the Bible. As it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Lot. Um, as Jonas was in the whale's belly. So he says, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted. And there's the key word there. Corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached. Or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And so we've been studying the issue of corruption, and I know I've been dealing with this for a while, so I'm going to kind of move forward on this, and uh, then we're going to be, end up in Genesis chapter 3. In Ephesians 4.22, the Bible says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. The old man is the flesh. It's what's on the outside of us. The new man is what has been conceived in us. That is what John was talking about when he said, That which is um, born of God sinneth not. The inward man in me does not sin. Because God is its father. Milton Don Hoggard is the father of this flesh. My daddy was a sinner. His daddy was a sinner. I'm a sinner. My sister is a sinner. Our mom is a sinner. Way mondo. But she got saved. Amen? So she has a new man on the inside of her. The old man is corrupt. And it's decaying more and more every day. How many of us feel that? Say amen. amen. Okay? It's like I, I equated our bodies to a car. You buy a new car, and it smells good. See, babies smell good. You rub that powder on them, and everything smells good. New cars smell good. We like new cars. And as that child grows, he's in that strength age. You get that car going, and boy, you can see what it can do. Then after a while, things start breaking on the car. After a while, things start breaking on the body. And you got to go get it maintained. you got to have checkups more often. Than you used to. Okay? Then after a while you have to start replacing parts. And in the body you got to start replacing stuff or fixing stuff that's broke. And then after a while you push the car over the ledge and say, I'm done with this thing. It's run its course. It's kept the faith. And I'm sick of it. I'm done with it. And that's what happens with us. You got to be buried and pushed off to the side. But that new man on the inside of us, in 1 Corinthians 15, is just like the seed. It raises up into a new body. But our former 
cut our old man is corrupt according to deceitful lust. Be careful. Your lust will deceive you. Your lust will change your doctrine. Amen? How many sodomites are pastoring churches today? More than should be. You know what happened? Their lust deceived them and it caused them to change their doctrine. In the old days, God did not tolerate adultery, fornication, sodomy. He did not tolerate those things. Society did not tolerate those things. Nowadays, we tolerate everything except for intolerance. Okay? They tolerate everything. Everything's okay. And it's cha this, the lust of churches and the lust of pastors and the lust of scholars has changed their doctrine concerning what they believe about God. Now God accepts everybody. Stay the way you are and everything's fine. That is the deceitful lust of the old man. Don't listen to it. Listen to God. Listen to the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. This is where uh, Peter is addressing... Uh, women, godly women. And he talks about how they, you know, don't worry about the outer adornment. Don't worry about trying to keep up with trying to make your body look like you're 18 again. He said, let your beauty, let it be of the hidden man of the heart. And that, and see, this is what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off this for a minute. The Southern Baptist Convention, they produce what's called the Holman Standard Bible. They came up with that Bible because they got tired of paying Zondervan royalties on the NIV for all their Sunday school literature. So they came up with their own Bible. <clears throat> and they said, boy, it's got integrity, and boy, we did it right, and we translated it right, this and that and the other. Now, lo and behold, in the newest edition of the Holman Standard Bible, they're turning more into the gender-neutral Bible. You will not find in these gender-neutral Bibles this doctrine of... A woman having the hidden man inside of her. Because that might offend women. And we can't let that happen. So let's change the gender of this statement. And let's make God neutral instead of who he really is. God is masculine. Can I get God's people to say amen? amen. Jesus is the son of his father. The Bible is very clear on that. And what has been conceived inside of us is that new man, not that new person, not that new thing, the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible. You catching that? What's on the inside of you doesn't corrupt. They put Christ's body in the tomb for two days and two nights, and on the third day, walks out of the tomb. His body did not, God did not allow his holy one to see corruption. So the new man is incorrupt, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped, watch this now, the corruption that is in the world through lust. There it is again. Um, let's see, Ephesians 4.22 he talks about corruption and deceitful lust. 2 Peter 1, 4, corruption through the lust that is in our flesh. The longer this body lives, the more it lusts. And the more it lusts, the corrupt, more corrupt it becomes. And we're just consuming our flesh with corruption. Revelation 19, 2, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, he's talking about Babylon the great, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. There it is again. Fornication, adultery, sodomy, the lust of the flesh cause corruption. They cause good men. I got to turn off that stupid popping noise. Do it again. I scared it. I scared it. Didn't do it. But your lust, be careful. 
The desires of your flesh will cause you to change in your mind who God is, what God is, what God allows, what God does not allow. It will cause you to do that. I had a guy I worked with years ago, uh, said he went to church, said he was a Christian, and uh, he had him a, he got him a live-in girlfriend. And he brought it up to me about marriage. And I said, well, I think if you're going to live this woman, I think you ought to marry her. Make it right. Well, I don't believe you have to do that. Why not? That's what the Bible says. Well, we're soulmates. I think God, we love each other. I think God wants us together. I said, maybe he does, but not the way you're doing it. And what happened was his lust changed his doctrine. He took a chisel, just like they did in the Old Testament days, and carved out an image of God that does not match the image that's in your Bible. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His Word is the same yesterday, today, forever. And God does not alter the thing that goes forth out of His mouth just because it's not popular anymore. He didn't do it with Israel. He's not going to do it with us. He's not going to change. But what we're seeing, if you want to understand the basis of why so many churches, denominations, ministries are going bad, lust is the answer to that. You may not be able to see it on the outside, but I promise you it's there, and that's what's changing men. Okay? Uh, I could tell you story after story, a man that I highly revered, thought the world of him, preached revivals, pastored churches, great soul winner, seemed to be, and uh, fell in love with a woman that wasn't his wife, run out on her, run out on his wife, the church men caught him at the motel with this woman. And told him, don't even bother coming by. We're going to put your stuff in boxes, set them out in the parking lot. You can come by and get them, but you're done. And instead of repenting, and instead of, of making it right with his wife, making it right with his children, because his, his grown adult children said, Dad, what are you doing? He is so much fallen for this other woman that he has abandoned everything. He walked away from his wife, walked away from his ministry, walked away from his reputation. I don't know, but he's walked away from everything. I don't know. But his lust changed his ideology, has changed his philosophy, changed his doctrine. You can't do that. The Bible's right in what it says, and it doesn't bend itself just because you've been in church so long. Can I get an amen out of somebody? First Timothy chapter 6, turn there. <clears throat> There are things in the Bible that sometimes my flesh doesn't like. I can't help that. I can't change it. I can't make God different just because of whatever situation you might be in. 1 Timothy 6, 3, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words. Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse dispute, uh, disputings of men of corrupt mind. Their mind is corrupt because their flesh is corrupt and it perverts their doctrine. It, they will dispute you and argue with you till both of you are blue in the face and you're not getting anywhere with them. And I've had that. I've had conversations with people on the phone where I give them scripture, give them scripture, give them scripture. Well, what, the Bible says this. Well, the Bible says this right here. And I'd be reading it to them. And they'd say, I don't care, but this is, this is how it really is. Well, that's not what the Bible says. I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible says. 
perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. I struggled for years with that idea of gain is godliness. In the word faith crowd, it means that if you are rich, filthy rich, then obviously you're right with God. The more money you have, the closer you are to God. God owes you money, so he's going to pay you because you have displayed the proper kind of righteousness, and so God has to pay you for that. God has to reward you for that. I'm quick to look at that and say, that's false, that's phony, that's, that's no big deal. Then years ago, I, I kind of got into this purpose-driven stuff. Rick Warren writes this book called The Purpose-Driven Church. And basically, he just, he just, uh, he's not nice about the idea of a church being small. And if you have a small church as a pastor, then obviously, you're not doing what God told you to do. Now let me settle that. In the parable of the seed and the sower, when God makes something fruitful, there was some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. In the parable of the, uh, the servants, where God gave, or the, uh, the, the master gave them certain talents, he gave one man five talents, he gave another man two talents, and it was according to what that master knew those men were capable of doing. And when they brought that back, when they both doubled it, the master said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He did not knock the one because he didn't bring in as much as the other did. Okay? So God dealt with me about that, about because I used to look at these big churches and say, what am I doing wrong? How come I don't have 500, 600, 1,000 people in church? How come I don't do this? And, I, and, it, and it made me wonder for a while that maybe I wasn't doing things right. And I was guilty of this idea of gain equals godliness. A big church does not necessarily mean that they're right with God. Especially in today's world. The, the more corrupt we get, if that church is going to maintain its biblical integrity, they will find that they cannot maintain high volumes of people inside that church. That's just how it is. And so God dealt with me about that issue as well. I used to get together with the preachers. How, and the question always is, how's your church doing? Which means, how many people do you have coming? Okay? And I wanted to lie. I wanted to not tell the truth. Because I knew what it was. It was a measuring device amongst us preachers. Well, if my church didn't have the number of people that Brother So-and-So's church did, obviously I wasn't as good as he was. And I used to really, that used to really get me. Okay? Gain is not godliness. Following what God said is godliness. Doing what God said, that's godliness. Um, Psalm 32, a godly man is one that will confess his sins to God and weep all night over it and let God forgive him. That's what a godly man does. Can I hear you say amen? And he said, from these people, from such, withdraw thyself. And I've used this analogy before. If you've got two bowls of something in the refrigerator, one of them's been in there a month, and one of them just went in there yesterday, the one that's a month old that's got a little forest of trees growing out of the top of it, you don't mix it in with the one you put in yesterday because that will purify the mold off the other. It does not work that way. You, what you want to do is take the moldy, nasty thing out of your refrigerator to spare what you just put in. And that's the same analogy here. There are some things... You guys on the internet, listen to me. I love you. Okay? Look at me right here. Okay? There are some things on YouTube you need to withdraw yourself from. There are some things on Facebook you need to withdraw yourself from. Don't get into watching every little conspiracy video, every little thing that pops up on the internet. Stay away from that stuff because a lot of it is corrupt and you'll end up falling into that corruption. Mandela effect. 
Amen? Okay, she knows, Rhonda knows exactly what I'm talking about, okay? Mandela effect. Somebody went back in time and changed the Bible. Now the Bible's all corrupt. I don't believe that stuff. Amen? Some, from such withdrawal thyself. Yes? 32. Psalm 32 is one of my favorite psalms. Anyway, a lot of that stuff you're just going to have to get away from, okay? And I make some people mad. They'll write me some kind of email telling me how wrong I am on this and wrong I am on that. And I'll tell, I'll write them, and they'll give me a list of YouTube videos to watch. And I'll tell them, what you need to do is shut down your internet connection and quit watching everybody and get your Bible out and read it. Because I guarantee you, you would have never come up with this stuff just from the Bible. Okay? Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 8. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. See that word reprobate? What does that mean? You see that word in the Bible very often. Reprobate. It means that, huh? Unsavable is a good term. Okay? Means that they have been put on probation and they have proven that they will not ever be right. So God now classifies them as reprobate. He has revoked their probation. Probation is about letting somebody out and the probation is you do good now for such and such a time then we can see that you are, uh, that you are um, somebody that is wanting to better yourself. You want to walk away from the old lifestyle and so on. And we're going to let you out for a while to see how you do. Now, if you mess up, if you mess up, we're going to pull you back in jail. I was with a guy that used to go to this church a long time ago. And he came to me and he's scared. I said, what's going on? He said... He said, I got to go to court tomorrow. He said, they're going to try to revoke my probation. And I said, okay. I didn't ask him what was going on, but I went with him, showed up with him. He just wanted somebody to pray with him in that. And I prayed with him and he was scared to death. And he got up on the stand and the, they, um, his lawyer was asking him all these softball questions, you know, how you doing? And he said, well, I've completed the drug program successfully and I've completed this successfully. The problem is he kept coming up with dirty drug tests. And then the prosecutor is, well, it wasn't prosecutor, it's his, his uh, probation officer. He got up and said, now, what was that again you said about how good you're doing? He said, well, I successfully completed this drug program. And he said, it's not successful if you're still doing drugs. And he went, oh. Well, the end result of that is they put him in handcuffs and led him away, and he had to serve the rest of his five-year prison sentence, okay? And from what I hear, he's not doing any better. Did for a while, but he's not. And he's got a brother that has been let out of prison, I don't know how many times. Did he finally die? You know who I'm talking about? I'm not going to say names, but... He, he overdosed on a bunch of pills and it put him in a coma. And he's been let out of prison, I don't know how many times, on probation, and he has never, ever stopped doing drugs. Okay? At some point, God gives up on working with people. You see it in Genesis. My spirit shall not always strive with man. God will give up. God will say they're reprobate. Concerning the faith, they're reprobate. And you can argue with them and argue with them and argue with them and you're never going to get anywhere. At some point, you stop casting pearls before the swine. And you just pull back and say, I'm done. Okay, I'm going to let God have you. Uh, 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, being born again, not of corruptible seed. Somebody say amen to that. Incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You want to go to heaven? Then be born again from incorruptible seed. Not of what men say. Of what God says. 
Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Where do I want to go? I got, I got some good. Let's, let's go back to uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Let's move forward from that. All right? I spent three Sundays telling you, don't be corrupt. How's that? I could have done it a lot quicker. Don't be corrupt, all right? 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve. How did he do it? How did the serpent beguile Eve? Through his subtlety, okay? So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. What does beguile mean? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? What does beguile mean? Huh? It's bold, bold-faced lie. He tricked you. He did it very subtly. Okay? Very smoothly. And here's the thing. And I've said this before. I don't have a problem addressing anything that I believe about God's Word and about God. I don't hide what I believe. I don't feel the need to uh, not say certain things because people might misunderstand it, that I've got to do this and do this and do this and do this. If you ask me a simple question, Pastor Mike, what do you believe about such and such? I'll probably quote Scripture and say, that's, that's what I believe. That's what the Bible says. Okay? So we don't hide our doctrine. Um, Jesus told the disciples, that which I speak in your ear, proclaim from the housetops. Tell everybody. There was a, um, a copy of the gospel, this is going to floor you now, the gospel of Judas Iscariot. The Gospel of Judas Iscariot, a tattered old manuscript in a clay jar discovered out in the Egyptian desert somewhere, and to date it is the only copy that we know of. Now the Vatican might have 20 of them down in the basement somewhere that they don't let anybody see, but as far as we know there's only one copy of the Gospel of Judas. Now. Let me just say something very simple to you. Judas did not write the good news of Jesus Christ. He did not come preaching glad tidings. Okay? That is called pseudepigrapha. Okay? Pseuda means like a pseudonym. Okay? You put a false name on it. Pig means it was written by pig, I guess. I don't know, but... Anyway, pseudepigrapha. Somebody wrote a false account of the life of Jesus Christ and put Judas's name on it. And here's kind of how it goes. The Gospel of Judas says that Judas wasn't really the bad guy that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John make him out to be. That Jesus went to Judas privately, secretly, away from the other disciples. Put his arm around him and said, Judas, I need your help with something. Okay? People are not following me and what we need is a scene. We need, we need something big to, to get them going. So here's what I want you to do. We're going to play good cop, bad cop. I'm going to be the good cop and you be the bad cop. And in exchange for this now, Judas, I'm going to teach you secret teachings that I learned from John the Baptist. And it's secret doctrines that are not in the Bible. Things that God knows that we can't just tell everybody. So Judas, in exchange for me telling you this new secret doctrine... Are you willing to play the bad guy? And Judas said, sure, I'll do it. So that's the story, that there's a secret doctrine that was handed to Judas Iscariot, and in exchange for that, Judas created this scene of making it look like he was against Christ, so Christ could be delivered to be killed and become a martyr, and Christianity would thrive. And then Judas was to pass this secret doctrine down only to the elect, only to the elite of people. Um, there is a teaching in the Apocrypha. And I've never read hardly any of the Apocrypha. That's the books between Malachi and Matthew that Catholic Church puts in their Bibles. And I've never read any of it except I, had a, I got a Bible that's got the Apocrypha in it. And I opened it up and just was thumbing through it. And I, I glanced upon a page and it caught my attention. 
and what it's te- I can't remember where it is, but Jeremiah, God told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, gather all the scribes that you can, because I'm going to I'm just going to give you a bunch of stuff. So Jeremiah grabs all these scribes, and God then is is downloading these teachings to Jeremiah, and he's giving certain of the scribes this teaching, and then certain of the scribes this other teaching. And he says, now you guys here, you take these documents that I gave you, and I want you to take them out to the streets and read them to everybody so that everybody can hear this part. But then there's 70 manuscripts here that we cannot tell everybody. We have to keep those secret. We can only give those to the elite, the initiated. Those who are wiser than everybody else. And we're going to hold these doctrines secret and not tell anybody. Brother George, I had a guy that I thought was solid, King James. Okay, And I'm not going to say his name because a lot of people would know the name. But he came and visited here one time. And he talked to me and told me that there was one place in the King James that was not translated right. And he winked at me and he said, now, I only tell the hardcore King James people this. I don't tell all the other King James people this. And I'm just going, do what? Yeah. And, I mean, I, I like the guy, I feel bad for him, but he is dead wrong. And if you believe that there's a mistake in the Bible, why do we have to keep this secret? So, that's beguiling people. The devil had something in his mind, an end game that he wanted to get Eve hooked into, that he said God had this knowledge, but he didn't tell Adam the other part of it. I am going to give you the secret doctrine. Because he said, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the idea is, is that God had something that he didn't tell Adam, but the serpent knew it, and he slipped out of heaven, and he brought this secret doctrine to mankind. He's, going to, he's the good guy. You ever heard of Prometheus? Does anybody know who Prometheus is? Prometheus is a, a god, a demigod, in, I don't know if it's Roman mythology or Greek mythology, but Prometheus saw that all of the gods in heaven had fire, and none of mankind had fire. And the gods did not want mankind to have fire, because then they would have power, And the gods didn't want that. So Prometheus stole fire from heaven and slipped down to earth and gave man the secret of making fire. Okay, And for that, Prometheus gets punished. Now, if you look beyond that story and you know the Bible, then you understand that Prometheus is, guess who? The serpent. The dragon. Who says he stole a secret doctrine from God and brought it to mankind because that's going to make mankind better. And it's not. God's way is still right. Amen? You see the deception, the beguiling. And what I'm telling you is this. I'm going to let you go. Those who hold a secret doctrine will never come right out and say it. You've got to, they've got to know that they can trust you that when they tell you you're not going to tell anybody else. And that is not of the Bible. We're supposed to tell everybody. Yes, very quickly. Yep. That's good. Yep. Yeah. He did. He said, now I only tell that to the hardcore King James people. You know what? I'm going to say this. I like the guy. I love him. And I want to pray for him. You don't know who he is, but I want you to pray for him. That that God will 
beat that out of him. Amen? Father in heaven, I love this book. And Lord, I, this book saved my life. And I want everybody to know, Lord, that they can trust your word. They can't trust anything in this world. They can trust your word. And God, you have, not withhold, you have not withheld anything from us. God, you've shared it all. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for revelation from heaven, bread from heaven. And Father, this man that I'm talking about, you know who it is. Father, you love him. I love him. I pray, dear God, that you would just soften him. God, that somehow, some way, Lord, you would show him, God, that this book is incorruptible seed. It can't be corrupted. And I pray, God, that you would just help him. Help us, dear God, because probably all of us will have our times of doubt, times when we're not sure. So, Father, we pray, dear God, as the disciples prayed, Lord, increase our faith. Help us, dear God, the older we get, to rely more and more and more upon this book and be wary of those who would beguile us. Father, just bless your word. Let it increase in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.